Okay, so this is actually take two of this video because it turns out the memory on my phone was full. So I've been sat here for the past hour talking to myself and not recording. Yay! But anyway, we're back now. I've sorted that one out. So uh, I guess we'll have to do this all over again. So welcome to this video, which is my 2020 knitting year in review. I've done one of these videos for my sewing year as well. So if you're more interested in sewing, feel free to check that one out. But guess what? I also do a lot of knitting and it turns out that I actually knitted more garments this year than I sewed. Oh, unless you count the scrubs. Let's not count the scrubs. I knitted more garments for myself this year than I sewed. So I've got quite a lot to rattle through that I want to talk about. And I'm going to do, I'm going to like walk through them in chronological order because I've realized that I haven't actually shared any of my knitting here on YouTube, I don't think, except from like just wearing it in videos. So you might recognize a few of these because I've been wearing them, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about them because every year with my sewing and my knitting I always want like to try new things so this year in particular I wanted to focus on color work and lace techniques and patterns and things um, in sort of you know improve my skills in that area. The very first thing that I knit this year were these Scandinavian style mittens and these this pattern let me check is called Naguselbu. Naguselbu? Yeah let's go with that and um, the reason I went for this pattern is because they're based on a 19th century pair of mittens that belonged to somebody's grandmother and they created a pattern it's available for free on Ravelry so I'll put a link to that in the description I'll link everything that um, I can link I'll put a link in description if it's a pattern that you can buy or whatever some of them might be affiliate links just so you know that means if you click them and make a purchase I get a small commission it doesn't cost you anything extra but it helps me to afford to keep buying yarn so you're perfectly entitled to not click them and go and do your own research and find these things for yourself but if you do thanks very much so this yarn was bought for me as a Christmas present from my brother and his girlfriend now wife and it's Jameson's and Smith jumper two ply Shetland wool can't remember what it's actually called but you know the one I mean and this came from one of my local yarn stores in Brighton Yak Yarn and Knitting and I started these back when I lived in Brighton and I started them at their knit night and um, I, had, I tell you, I had a right palaver I, this was about the third or fourth attempt at making these type of knit mittens because my tension was so off <laughs> I've never had that before where my tension is that far off I was going to have to like size down my needles four or five times and so I kept changing patterns and eventually I found this one which worked with my tension and I'm really pleased I spent the time to do it because I love these and I've gotten so many compliments on these. I posted a picture of them on Instagram and I got so many beautiful comments about they're the most beautiful mittens I've ever seen and stuff and I was a bit surprised but um, yeah. They're, they are, they are beautiful, I love them and uh, I went for green and orange because I often wear my green 1940s coat I made with a triangular orange shawl that I knitted last year and um, yeah I love, I love those two and I love wearing them together and I love the combination of green and orange so that's what I went for so I love when I've got the shawl and the coat and the mittens on I feel very coordinated <laughs> um, yeah, which I love so they were my very first colour work project of the year and then uh, from there I actually kind of got really into vintage knitting and so the next thing I made was a 1940s um, jumper sweater depending on where you're from this was intended to be part of a twin set I bought the pattern off Etsy from I believe it's called Pamula Vintage I'll put a link if there is I think the shop might close down but anyway if, if, if I find the link I'll share it with you and I absolutely fell in love with the texture of this pattern and I knew I wanted to knit a twin set because uh, one of the things about vintage knitwear, you can you can buy plenty of vintage knitwear. Some of it doesn't survive because it gets eaten by moths and such and unravels and things like that. But it's so rare to find a twin set because obviously the cardigan and the jumpers get separated or the cardigan wears out and the jumper doesn't and all that sort of thing. So I knew I was gonna have to knit my own if I wanted a vintage twin set. So I started on this vintage twin set and then I was using vintage yarn and I didn't have enough. For, to, to finish the cardigan so I've actually only just unraveled that and I'm reusing the yarn for something else now but I did complete the jumper and I at first I wasn't sure how I felt about this it was such an odd 
thing to me to wear like a knitted short sleeve jumper but I've actually absolutely fallen in love with them and I wear them all the time um, because this one's that because it was vintage yarn it was the, th the correct three ply weight those are actually so difficult to find if you know where to find them um, in or um, you know contemporary yarn brands that do a three ply weight please do let me know because I really struggle to find them so to have it in a vintage weight I absolutely it makes a lot more sense I've since made a four ply one and it's just a bit too chunky it's it's this has the feel of a t-shirt where this feels like a, a, a proper woolly jumper so now I understand why the three ply is so important um, so I, do, I wear this one quite a lot I love this color red I love that like it's it's so effective with the texture I love the texture oh my god so this was my first 1940s project of the year and I quickly fell down a 1940s vintage knitting rabbit hole I bought so many vintage knitting patterns this year and uh you know i created a whole pinterest board <laughs> of them absolutely fell in love with it so the next thing i made was actually this was a free pattern that i found on pinterest and they're available on somebody's blog and this is a pair of 1940s knitted lacy stockings and oh my god this was such a mammoth project but it what it turned out so well so i actually find so this is these are two ply weight and i actually found this yarn in a charity shop in brighton i couldn't believe my luck because it was a whole cone for 99p and real wool two ply weight vintage you know post decimalization but so 1970s probably and it was it was just like meant to be i was so thrilled and this turned I mean this was a mammoth project like just knitting two ply is takes forever because it's so fine but adding all the stocking construction all the lace work you know this pattern it's got um a folded over top so there's a line of picket picket edging halfway around so that you get a picket edge when you fold it over and then you have to like knit it to, you know and stitch it in place and then you have to do a line of run stops which i'd never done before and uh, then start the lace pattern and all the shaping it was a really involved project and of course the thing is when you knit socks or stockings you finish one and then you have to start on the other but it was so worthwhile and um, I really love these and I have worn these a couple of times but you know they're a bit wearing stockings as a whole palaver it's a big thing but I'm so glad I have these because they, they look so authentic and I love that you know kind of real 1940s sort of woolly make do amend look um, and I was able to get a really cracking picture of me <laughs> wearing these and my 1940s dress that I made this year, the green one. And uh, yeah, I really love that photograph. A lot of other people like that photograph as well. And uh, a lot of, should we say, stocking enthusiasts have found that photograph. So it's turned out to be one of my most liked photos of the year. Um, that's the danger, isn't it? You innocently knit some stockings as part of a historical knitting project you're on and uh, you accidentally uncover all the fetishists. After those stockings, I, there was such a long-winded project. I just wanted something, a bit of a palette cleanser, quick and easy. And so I, what I did was I made, I took part in a knit along actually, I think this, so this was, this is the Honey Bop cardigan from Poison Girls. G girls. I've been a pattern tester for them before. I was a pattern tester for the Rizzo blouse. And I really love their patterns. I really love that sort of, um, it's not something I do very often these days, but I really love it on other people. Um, like the rockabilly pin-up 50s style. And so when I saw they had this sort of, it's quite a classic cardigan shape, I knew I wanted one. And so I took part in the knit along. And I'm, to be honest, I'm not thrilled with how this turned out. And that's, the pattern itself was brilliant. It's one of these uh, modern constructions, which is seamless, which I don't do very often because I'm a seamstress. I really don't mind sewing things up. In fact, I prefer sewing things up. I think you've got more control over fit and all those sorts of things. And it's easier to alter patterns that way. But um, every now and again, I do these type of seamless constructions, top down and all that picking up stitches and things but I don't love it but the thing with this cardigan is I chose a inexpensive yarn because I'm not particularly well off and so I just went for color this is King Cole touch of merino merino blend or something like that and it's very affordable I used it again for this jumper but it hasn't worn particularly well 
and I think with such a straightforward design like this one I really needed a slightly more special yarn this just looks like it just looks cheap really doesn't it and so I'll probably make another one I haven't finished this one it hasn't got buttons on it yet I have worn it quite a lot because it's quite a nice little sort of it kind of wears like a shrug um, it's not too warm um, but if I if I make it I think I will size up because it's quite a fitted design and I you know don't really like my clothes to be that fitted so yeah if I make it again I'll size up and I think I'll go for probably like semi-solid mottly type yarn because uh, yeah I'm not sure I'm not sure how much this works as a design uh, but I'll keep wearing it around the house and things because it's quite nice and warm and soft and things so in February before pandemic <laughs> chaos hit I went to Unravel in Farnham the yarn festival and it's quite good because it's quite I'm you know I'm from this area so I know Farnham and um, the Maltings where it's hosted is quite an accessible venue so uh, and I was pretty mobile at the time so I just went with my walking stick and my mum drove and things like that so we went together to Unravel and that was um, like a lovely sort of day out for the two of us and I went in uh, the thing with these yarn festivals I always think there's so much on offer it, you just get overwhelmed you see so many inspirational things and you think oh I want that I want that you know I want to knit that I want to buy that yarn and uh, I had to go in very in a very restrained way <laughs> so I knew I had the pattern for this jumper and it was a two ply yarn weight I needed and so I knew I was looking for a really lovely beautiful two ply weight yarn because I was having real difficulty finding one online because if you put in two ply you just get like you know heavier weights that are plied together to ply as opposed to two ply weight. I was able to find the yarn for this project from a company called Uppingham Yarns and they had the most beautiful selection of like lace weights for Shetland shawls and things like that and so this is a lamb's wool oh it's beautiful but I'll get onto that in a second. So I was with my mum and my mum likes to knit but she tends to knit pretty straightforward things and often she knits for charity you know hats for premature babies things like that we walked past a store and they had a sample knitted up of these mittens and I think the patterns for this is called the Natica mittens I'll double check and she absolutely loved them she thought they were so cute but she was really sad she was like I'm not good enough to knit those and I said well I'll knit them for you it'll be a present for your birthday um choose your yarn you know and it will be my birthday present to you so uh, we bought the pattern the stand was uh the yarn company is Irish artisan yarns and they have some beautiful um, colorways it's that sort of hand dyed painted type yarn indie dyer that's what I'm talking about which I don't use very often and my mum certainly doesn't so this was their sock you know merino sock blend nylon that type of yarn <laughs> I really know what I'm talking about here uh, but yeah these knitted up beautifully and so these are these are for my mum these were for my mum and she's been wearing them these this winter and um, they're very much she likes shades of blue and turquoise and things so these are really her colors yeah so that was I made those in March I think and that I got at Unravel and then my next project from what I got at Unravel was this lacy jumper and this when I posted about this on Instagram I think I captioned it the best thing I have ever knit and I I stand by that this is honestly I think one of my proudest achievements <laughs> ever like I'm more proud of this than I am of my master's degree maybe not quite but it's up there so you know sometimes you have projects and you're like I will one day be good enough to knit that or to make that that's like where I want to get to with my skills that was how I felt about this I had this pattern for a while and I finally felt like okay I was there I'm gonna give it a go and uh yeah I found the yarn it turned out beautifully I've, I love it so much um so it's a pattern it's got a lace repeat and a cable repeat so <laughs> I hadn't realized it had cables in when I first decided to make it so it was like all the extra steps and then of course it's got this fair isle yoke which the pattern frustratingly said to use oddments of two ply <sighs> but I actually um, ended up using cruel embroidery wool which I got from I think lovecrafts.com or something like that you know somewhere really bog standard and generic and uh, the joys of ordering online the purple in this pattern was supposed to be navy blue but I got the shade wrong you know with the shade card but I actually really like the purple I think it really with the yellow in particular the gold it really ties in nicely and it sort of lifts it a bit I think the navy would have dragged it down because it, with it being so close to the face so yeah I just love this I wear this all the time 
It's so beautiful, it's so soft. It's just everything I want from my vintage knitwear, like hobby, I suppose. It was, I'm just I'm so proud of it. It was such hard work. Oh my God, it took me ages to knit, but so satisfying and really enjoyable as well. I think that's the thing. Like when I just knit stock in there, I get really bored. So I really love these textured patterns, these lace repeats, things like that. And this was a really special one. And I'm so, so proud of it. If I if I were a garment, this I would be this garment. I think <laughs> that's how I feel about this. And um, I will treasure this for a long time and wear it, hopefully, until it goes into holes and then I'll mend it or I'll knit another one because <laughs> I've still got half a cone of this yarn left. So after my 1940s lacy project, I was kind of done with lace for the time being. I was like, no, that's it. I've had enough. And so what I wanted to do instead was practice some Fair Isle. Oh, what I forgot to mention about this pattern and this one as well is that these are actual patterns I own, but I do have digital reprints available in my Etsy shop if you're interested. So I'll put links to this one and this one uh, in the description. This one is, was, is a Penelope jumper and it was a rare thing because it was a 1940s Fair Isle pattern with a chart because normally 1940s fair isle patterns are like knit three blue knit two white knit three blue knit two you know and it's uh, like it's too much for my brain to handle so this one had a chart and so this is why i wanted to give this one a go and i made it in the original colors apart from they said to use white and i used off white because white doesn't really suit me i'm quite yellow in my complexion so white really washes me out so i have to go for off white or cream so this this pattern was for a three ply but like I say it's so difficult to find three ply yarns and I'd made a couple of things in this um well like I've made this in this King Cole Merino and the tension came out slightly smaller than what the it's it usually is for four ply for me so I thought I'd use this it is a bit dense is all I would say but the other benefit of using a slightly heavier heavier weight um, yarn is that most vintage knitting patterns are for 34 bust and I'm more like 36 so uh, yes they do stretch but in using that slightly a heavier weight yarn it does end up being fractionally bigger and more like my size so I'm quite pleased with how this one turned out um, at first I wasn't again like with the like with this red one I wasn't sure how I, I felt about the whole short sleeve jumper thing uh, I didn't think there would be a place for this in my wardrobe, but I actually do wear this all the time. <laughs> I wore this in my co-COVID video. If you've seen that one, you'll recognize it. And it's kind of, we're kind of like a thing at the moment, the puff sleeve, puff short sleeve knitwear. I've seen some contemporary patterns that are similar and, um, you know, I really like this neckline and things like that. So it sort of feels as much as it's absolutely an authentic reproduction of a 1940s pattern, it also feels kind of modern somehow. So I wear it quite often with jeans and, you know, black skinny jeans and things like that. I've worn it with and it feels it's that lovely mix of vintage and modern, which I'm liking to do more and more these days. I do much less authentic 1940s vintage everything must be historically accurate because I don't leave the house. So <laughs> I much prefer this sort of blend of modern and cozy and vintage. Whereas with this, for this for this Honey Bop cardigan, the, this King Cole touch of merino looked really cheap. It's kind of fine for this one because the pattern's so jazzy and uh, it's holding up quite well. It's very warm, but then I'm quite a cold person, so I don't mind. Moving on. After I made this one, I was kind of a bit done with 1940s patterns. Not so much, it wasn't like I was, I'd completely lost my love for them. I still absolutely love them. I'm knitting a 1940s pattern right now. I just wanted to change. And so I'd seen on Instagram this Fable Knitwear brand and they made all these really gorgeous sort of history, bounding, historically inspired, quite romantic designs. And uh, so I decided I was gonna try a few of those. So I bought two patterns at once, I bought the yarn for two at once, and I started with this one, which is from the Yuletide collection, and it's the Nutcracker jumper. And I really love this design. I thought, oh, it's like, you know, Christmassy, but kind of modern and vintage, but I just thought it was really beautifully designed. I loved the textures in it. I loved the bobbles. I thought it was so unique and I was really excited to get knitting and I bought quite expensive yarn. This is a Cascades yarn. Well, it's expensive for me. 
and um, with Cascades. We don't often get Cascades in Britain, so I can't really remember where I found it. It's kind of more of an American brand, like it was measured in ounces. That it was that Amer American. When it turned up, I wasn't thrilled with the color, but actually it's really grown on me. I really love this kind of mottly green brown and I wear it a lot. The only thing I will say is I had an absolute nightmare with this pattern. It didn't fit me at all. And this is another one of those because it's a modern pattern, it's knit in the round. And so um, I just kind of had to keep knitting and trust, you know, with the raglan sleeves because you knit halfway up the body and then you knit both the sleeves and then you join it together. And I joined it together and it was drastically too small. It looked ridiculous and I was devastated because it was like I'd spent all this money on this yarn and, oh, and I really didn't know what to do. So I went, I didn't know whether like had I done something wrong because my tension was spot on for the pattern. Had I measured something wrong? I kept going over it. And um, the designer, I think she's called Helene. Yeah, she's, she's Scandinavian. And so I'd seen quite a few mentions online about Scandinavian patterns being a bit different and being a little more sort of loose and open to interpretation. I don't know whether that's true because I've only ever knitted this one and then another Scandinavian pattern from the same designer. So I went on Ravelry to look at people who'd made the same size as me. Did they have a similar issue, issues to me? Was it quite narrow in the shoulders? The sleeves, which are supposed to sort of be bishop sleeves and blouse over, were really like sh almost three quarter length on me. They really were not long enough. And I found uh, like a sort of you know, sometimes you like just connect with people on Instagram. You like all the same photos. They comment on your posts all the time. You comment on their posts all the time. So I have this Instagram friend, Miss M Vintage, and she had made one and she, I found her Ravelry page for it. She had made the most detailed notes about all the alterations she had to make to this pattern. And she really sort of really walked you through it step by step. I had to do this. I had to add a rose here. And this is how I altered this. This is how I altered this. I had to make the bicep bigger, all this sort of stuff and it was an absolute godsend. I could not have knit this jumper without you, Em. So thank you so much for your sharing your instructions and your help with this. So I essentially had to frog the entire thing. So I frogged the sleeves. I don't think I frogged them right the way back, but almost to about here and then added more increases, added more length, added about three more repeats to the body and uh, was able to make it long enough. I had to make the shoulders broader. I had to change the decreases. I had to change the neckline. I really had to do a lot of work to get it to fit and it was a right pain, but I'm glad I did it. I wear it a lot. It's quite dense. I think because this is a double knit and I usually work, wear four ply these days or even lighter, to wear a double knit sweater for me feels really heavy and really bulky, but it, it, it's really warm and cozy and I love it and I feel Oh, yeah, it's just got that perfect sort of romantic historical vibe. I really love wearing it, but I was, it was such a nightmare to knit and it kind of put me off seeing as I'd already bought the yarn and the pattern for the next Fable Knitwear project, it really put me off. So once I completed this one, I thought to myself, nope, I'm doing something different. I'm going in a different route. I'm not doing that. It was the Capulet blouse. I'm not doing that just yet. So instead I'd found somebody else on Instagram who really inspired me this year. And that's, I think it's Cleo MC on um, Instagram, but she's Constance and she's stitching over the days here on YouTube and she has a knitting podcast. And she was working on, or had just finished, um, something from Alice Starmore's Tudor Roses. And it's a beautiful book and it's very much, well, it's called Tudor Roses. It's inspired by Tudor Queens. So it's very historical, very history bounding. And um, she shared about her Jane Seymour cardigan, I think it was. And I absolutely fell in love with this book and this designer. So I bought the book. Oh, have I put it here? <laughs> and the first project I worked on from this was the Elizabeth Woodville cardigan. So this is the first one in the book. Obviously, Elizabeth Wood Woodville was... Um, my War of the Roses knowledge is not good. What's he called? Edward the fourth edward the fifth edward the fourth edward the fourth's wife and so that's about 1400s war of the roses so this is very much medieval inspired but it's so beautifully balanced this is the kind of design that i go nuts for because it's subtle but like the detail of the curved hem the balance of the curved hem and the collar and the trim 
and the curved hem of the sleeves. It's so beautifully shaped. I'd never knitted a garment with darts before, but this kind of has that darted construction where you sort of increase here as opposed to not just at the side. And do you know, this sat in my uh, UFO pile for the longest time because I couldn't be bothered to sew on the buttons. I don't know why I waited so long because I did it this week and I've been wearing it all week. It's such a gorgeous design. I really love it. And I can't wait to knit more from this book. The only thing I would say is I didn't buy the uh, official Alice Starmore, what are they called, virtual yarns? I can't remember because they're expensive and I'm not very well off. So I went for, again, this is Jameson and Smith Shetland jumper two ply or whatever it's called. And, um, because it's more affordable and they had similar sort of colors in that sort of tweedy effect but it's it's quite scratchy so i have to wear this over long sleeves otherwise it's just too itchy and it is it is it's also one of those cases where i was between sizes and often i size up in things because i like my clothes to be baggy and i'm so glad i did because i have to wear a long sleeve top under this and all that sort of stuff because it's scratchy so i'm really pleased with this one i really recommend that book and she's one of those knitwear designers where because i've knit so many 1940s patterns this year where it's kind of like reverse shaping and repeat at the same time and that's the only instruction you get uh, this was such a nice change to have a pattern where it was like row row 16, knit 3, purl 2 together, you know, really sort of detailed in row by row instructions. Yeah, I really enjoyed knitting this and I'm really enjoying wearing it, so I can't wait. I think I might make the Elizabeth I next. Um, they've got some really beautiful colour work designs in there as well. Not all of them are to my taste, but yeah, there are some really gorgeous ones. So I think I might have to make the Elizabeth I one because I wrote my undergrad dissertation on Elizabeth I, so I kind of want that one just for old time's sake. So at this point, I was still procrastinating making this Capulet blouse <laughs> from Fable Knitwear. I was too scared to start. And also it was about this time of year when shops were opening up again and I made a very conscious decision to go out and support my local and favourite sort of independent yarn shops. So I bought a lot of skeins of yarn that um, I didn't have plans for and just one skein and things. So this was one of those projects. I bought this, I think this is West Yorkshire Spinners and I kind of just looked on Ravelry for patterns for it. I knew I wanted so for a while, I knew I wanted a grey beret because I have this grey beret, which I bought from that shop in Waterloo Station, which the name escapes me, something like Joy. I think it's Joy anyway. And I love this and I wear this hat a lot, but it's a bit fancy and it's not great for vintage outfits because it's obviously quite a modern Chanel thing. So I knew I wanted another more traditional historical kind of grey berry and so this one is a free pattern that was on Ravelry again I'll put a link in the description it's called the Druidess beret and it's got this beautiful cable design and cable and bobbles and yeah I just it was a really fun little project to knit up I don't often make sort of accessories for myself I tend to make garments but it was a, this made a nice change um I'm not sure about the shape of this I think it might need blocking because it's a bit small it doesn't really sort of pouch over the way I like a beret too but I really do love it's lovely and warm and I really love the texture of this pattern so this was a nice little palette cleanser project between all my enormous cardigan vintage historical knitting patterns this year so then finally I decided it couldn't be put off any longer and I should make the Capulet blouse and uh, I believe this yarn is Gilead, which is one of the favorites at Yak. And I absolutely understand why. It was really gorgeous to knit with. God, a lot of dye came out of it though when I blocked it. Whew, that was scary. Um, but yeah, it's so interesting because having had all the drama with the Nutcracker jumper, I was really dreading knitting this. And it was so straightforward. Like it fit me exactly as it was supposed to. It knitted up perfectly to size. The instructions were really clear everything turned out long enough. I don't think I even made any alterations. I think I just knit it as is. Maybe I made the sleeves a fraction longer or something like that. But yeah, I was, it was like night and day compared to the Nutcracker jumper. Really enjoyable to knit. I'm, and I'm, when I finished it, it was one of those, a bit, I suppose quite a few of them have been like that this year. I really didn't think I was gonna wear it. I was thinking, do I have a place for a, like a low neck, short three quarter length sleeve fitted knitted top in my life. Turns out I do. I wore, I've worn it a lot. It's perfect. It was perfect in autumn, you know, when it's kind of too warm for a thick coat or whatever and too too cold for short sleeves. This was the perfect kind of transitional seasonal top. 
I love the colour, I love this sort of cable texture. You know, it's just, it's perfectly romantic and historical. It's sort of somewhere, feels quite Renaissance, but it also feels quite sort of 1930s vintage somehow, or like 1950s evening knitwear, which was a thing, you know. Um, yeah, I really love it. And I was really surprised by that. So it just goes to show, because I feel really bad for having said so much shit about that pattern, that Nutcracker jumper pattern, but that was my experience. And it obviously wasn't just my experience because quite a few people had similar experiences on Ravelry. But don't let that put you off any of the other designs because, I mean, I've only knit these two, but this, you know, this was a joy. So um, yeah, don't let me put you off. And I can, I still recommend the Nutcracker pattern because it is so, such a great design, but just be aware that you've got to have your wits about you, make sure you measure everything twice, make sure everything's long enough, make sure everything's broad enough. But this one it was, was a much more pleasant experience to knit. Oh my God, this is long, we're nearly there. So the next project, and this technically is, uh, I guess, UFO, work in progress, I don't know. The next thing I started on was a Marie Wallen yell cardigan I guess it is jacket I don't know um like I say I one of my goals for this year was to work on my color work and my lace work and I'd done a big lace work project and I wanted to do a big Shetland Fair Isle project and this was the one I love these Marie Wallen Shetland designs um they're sort of perfect to me they're just she's she's got such brilliant use of color and the balance of them is brilliant and um I really wanted to do it and I worked on this for about two months and I got it to this point and you can probably tell the point I'm at is I have to cut the steaks and I'm too scared to do it. <laughs> well partly it's not necessarily that I'm too scared to do it so what happened was I um, was knitting this and then I got really ill and obviously with this kind of feral you have to really concentrate and I just didn't have the brain space to keep up with this fair owl pattern, to keep up with the repeats, I kept making mistakes. So I decided I had to park this and I worked on it. I would get better a bit and I would work on it and I'd have to keep abandoning it. So I got it to this point, I stitched it up ready to steak and I was like, this is, I've never steaked anything before. I've never cut any steaks. And I was like, I do not want to do this at this point in my life with my brain and the condition it is because if I ruin this after all this work I've done I will be absolutely gutted and like buying the yarn for this was like 90 pounds worth of yarn which is a hell of a lot of money for me anyway to buy on for one project so I really didn't feel like I was in a position where I could risk it. I'm starting to feel a bit better so I think when I finish my current Work in, work in progress, my current 1940s knit I'm doing, I will go back to this and steak it and knit the sleeves. But yeah, I just, I couldn't face it. Like the prospect of cutting the wrong thing because I'm so brain foggy, like that would have been so heartbroken. So I made the decision to park it for the time being, but I've really enjoyed knitting this. Um, it's just glorious. It's, this was one of those things that, and I always think this with Fair Isle actually, tell you the most difficult thing about this was casting on because it's like 300 stitches and I kept like getting a twist in the stitches and then the round and all of that that was the most difficult part but the color work it looks so complicated because it's so many different colors but you're only ever working with two colors at a time so it's actually if you take it row by row it's not that difficult and so I was really surprised by how much I enjoyed this, how straightforward it actually turned out to be. And of course you're knitting in the round so you don't have to purl Fair Isle. Uh, the only thing was the, this original band of color was really exciting because you're constantly breaking off colors and joining in new colors. This gray section took for freaking ever and was so boring. I, oh, I really was fed up with it by the end of it. But um, I can't wait to wear it, honestly. This, I know it's, it's one of those things I hate abandoning knitting projects halfway through but I know I'm going to finish this one because I absolutely love it and I cannot wait to wear it so as soon as I feel as soon as I'm done with my next project and as soon as I feel well enough to I will be sticking this and knitting the sleeves and the, the neck band and all of that and I cannot wait to add it to my uh, winter wardrobe really maybe it will be it might be spring by the time I actually finish it but let's see but one side sort of parked that yell, I was well enough to start working on more complicated knitting projects, but not 
well enough to work on that complicated feral design. So what I did was, and I'll be honest with you, the reason that I bought them was because they have an affiliate program. <laughs> I bought two kits from We Are Knitters. So the first one is this one, and the second one is this one that I'm wearing. Now, um, I bought them, I didn't want to join the affiliate program without actually knitting them, because that's fraud, I suppose. So I thought to myself, right, I'll buy two and I'll test two, and if this is something that I genuinely recommend and really enjoyed, I'll you know, apply for the affiliate program and become an affiliate. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna do that because uh, I'll be honest with you, I knit this one a month ago and it is already so fluffy and bobbly. I've had to shave it so often. I'm really disappointed. Yeah, like these were not cheap. These were not, this is not cheap yarn. It was not a cheap kit to buy. And, um, I'm really disappointed with the quality of the yarn. So yeah, I'm not gonna become an affiliate. That being said, I do still really like the designs. So this one is the, it's called like bomber jacket, bomber cardigan, something like that. And this, like the gimmick with um, these kind of companies, this one is We Are Knitters, there's another one, isn't there? Wool and the Gang, I think it is, is that uh, it's for new knitters. So the the garments are supposed to be modern and trendy and something you're actually going to wear and they're quite simple to knit and great for beginners and if you're learning to knit and all that stuff. And that absolutely is valid and has a place. It's just not my thing. I'm too advanced a knitter, I think, to enjoy this type of very straightforward knitting because the construction for this is all rectangles. So you knit uh, like one strip for the front, another strip for the other front, one rectangle for the back. You stitch them up. You pick up the stitches for the sleeves evenly and knit a you know and knit like a dropped sleeve. You pick up the stitches for the neckband and you knit a straight band. And that's fine. That's a perfectly valid way to make a cardigan. Like I say, it's just not for me. And these were both, I think this one was intermediate and this one was advanced. And yes, it's advanced because there's a lace pattern, I suppose, but the shaping is not advanced in my opinion. And I, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, to say it cost, like this one cost me 60 quid, I'm just a bit disappointed. I wish I'd spent the money on something else, I think really is the gist of it. On a positive note, this is the petite wool and it's so soft and cozy. It is really fluffy and all, you know, squishy and really lovely to wear. It's just such a shame that it's so, this, like this was, I wore this for two days before it was covered in bubbles. I was so disappointed and it sort of just makes it look kind of grubby somehow and not nice and it's really disappointing, but I'm continuing to wear it because it's so cozy. It's just gone from being something that I thought that I would love to wear and would wear out and would really sort of make an outfit to being something I wear over my pajamas when it's a bit cold, <laughs> you know, which is like, is a shame for the amount of money I spent on it is a shame. But this one, this is the thread sweater. And this is, I think it's called Finita uh, yarn, which is much finer. And you know, it was three millimeter needles. And uh, this one I think was more successful. I will say I changed the neckline. I altered the neckline because this just had a straight across neck and I could see in the photograph on the model the way it was rolling over and I was like, yeah, I don't like that. That's definitely gonna happen. That's gonna be really annoying. It's gonna rub against my neck all the time and be like a, a nightmare. So I shaped a neckline and I added this um, guard stitch band to match the cuffs and the hem. And I like, I really like this one. I will say it knitted up really small, like particularly compared to the way it was styled. So that was something that kind of aggravated me as well, because in the photograph of the pattern, which I'll probably put on the screen somewhere for you to see, it's a really big oversized sweater. The model is obviously a small and it's this really big, you know, relaxed fit, oversized. And so I assumed that there was design ease. It was supposed to be a relaxed baggy jumper. That was the way it was supposed to fit. And that was, um, you know, accounted for in the pattern. Nope, turns out it was a small girl in a size large or extra large or whatever, because I'm a medium. I measure a medium exactly. This knitted up as a medium and it's, it's, yeah, it, it, I had to block it to be able to get into it almost. It was so, tight and short and not at all the relaxed oversized fit I was hoping for. But I still like it and I still wear it and like the sleeves are kind of bracelet length but 
you know, so <laughs> I really did not have a positive experience of that company, which is unfortunate, I suppose. And I decided against applying to be an affiliate because I cannot in good faith recommend them. Perhaps if you're learning to knit and you need a kit and you don't have any of the gear and you don't know what you're doing, something like that might be for you but it's not for me and I don't think it's for you, my audience, either. My current project, I'm making a ribbed jerkin, original 1940s project. I actually, so my current work in progress, um, you know how I mentioned that this was originally intended to be a twin set and I ran out of yarn? Yes, yeah, so I unpicked the startings of the cardigan I made for this and I'm turning it into a ribbed jerkin. I'll put a photo of what that's, that means here. Yeah, and it's really, it's knitting up quite nicely. I'm really enjoying knitting it. It's got this really interesting diagonal rib pan ribbed panels uh, and I'm excited to wear it. It doesn't take a huge quantity of yarn, which is why I'm making it from the yarn that I didn't have enough of to make a cardigan. And I'm really excited to finish that and add to the red things in my wardrobe. <laughs> So for the for the sewing year in review, I came up with some like questions or things I should talk about more generally about my knitting for the year, as opposed to each individual project. Hang on, I need a drink, my voice is going. So the first question is, what have I learnt? I've definitely learnt the importance of knitting attention swatch this year. <laughs> that for sure has been something I've learnt my lesson a couple of times the hard way and a couple of times by doing it properly and being like, oh, I'm so glad I needed a swatch. Yeah, I think that's the thing. When you, previously in my knitting, when I, I knitted everything in acrylic and only used free patterns off Ravelry, so I didn't spend a lot of money, I would skip a swatch because I was like, ah, sod it, who cares? If it doesn't turn out right, it doesn't turn out right. Now, where I'm at a place where I'm investing a lot more uh, money to start with, and also time and effort into these more complex designs, I absolutely understand the value of knitting a swatch. So that's definitely something I'll take with me into 2021. Always knit a swatch, particularly if you've spent a lot of money on a project or you have high hopes for it. So what was easier than expected and what was harder than expected? Definitely what was easier than expected was the fair owl for the for the yell. I mean, like I say, the hardest bit was casting on. The fair owl repeat itself was actually really fun and quite straightforward. I must like, I will caveat that with saying, when I went to the knitting club at Yak, um, when I was knitting this at the time, I was able to memorise the pattern repeat and the lady sitting next to me was like, how can you do that without looking at the pattern? And I was like, I don't know, I just remember it and you know, I get to a knit stitch and I realise that has to be a purl stitch this row and I kind of figure it out and it all makes sense. And she looked at me like I was like a witch, you know, like I was some magician who were being able to do that. And that's just my brain is sequencing and patterns and things like that. You know, that's what I'm good at, particularly numerical patterns. Like if it's letters, oh boy, no, my brain can't cope with that. But numbers, you know, I can remember streams of numbers in a row. I can remember information like that. So I think that's possibly why um, this sort of thing works well with my brain. It might not be the same for you, but this for me was easier than expected. What was harder than expected? Hmm, good question. The nutcracker jump was harder than expected. <laughs> and um, also like persevering with a knitting project. I think, n n like, I don't, want to, I don't want to keep blaming the pattern, but what I found difficult was to keep going when things get tough. Knitting can be so frustrating. I had to frog some things this year you know, and I don't normally do that sort of thing. I normally just abandon projects and bin them because I haven't spent a lot of money on them. But with this, like even with the mittens, I had to keep frogging, I had to keep re-swatching, retensioning, trying new patterns out, trying new needles out. And this was, you know, back in January. And that determination to carry on, I found really difficult. It's always worth it in the end, I find. Oh, well, it's not always worth it, but it's often worth it. So, so much that was much more difficult than I expected, just keeping going when something isn't going right. Oh, what would I do differently? <laughs> Bloody hell, <laughs> what a nightmare. <laughs> so what would I do differently? This chair with the wheels on this floor is a bloody nightmare. What would I do differently? I wouldn't wait so long to sew the buttons on my Elizabeth Woodville cardigan. That's what I would do <laughs> because I love it so much and I've been wearing it so much. I can't believe I waited like five months before sewing the buttons on. I also, again, would not, I would have started the Capulet blouse sooner because it was really, it's, it's a really lovely pattern and I really <laughs> like that mate. So yeah, what I think I would do differently is do the things that I'm putting off, stop procrastinating things because they're never as bad 
as you think they are in your head, basically. So what's my favorite make and my most disappointing make? Uh, my favorite make is definitely this one. Like I've talked about it already. I won't bore you with that again. Absolutely, Mwah. my favorite make. Not just of 2020 ever. My most disappointing make is that I'm going with the Honeybop cardigan just because it didn't work. It didn't, something about it didn't work. Again, I think it's the yarn choice. I think it's the sizing I got wrong. I think, yeah, it just wasn't right for me. That's a shame. Actually, I've changed my mind. This is more disappointing because this looks like a cheap cardigan because it's made with cheap yarn. This looks cheap, but it was made with expensive yarn. So that is more disappointing, in my opinion, than this. So I wanna talk a little bit about what am I, what am I doing next year? Well, first of all, I'm finishing my yell. <laughs> my yell cardigan. I really want to get that finished. I really want to sort of complete that project and have the satisfaction of that. The great thing about reflecting on everything you've done in a year is you get to pick what you really enjoyed and what wasn't as successful. So my favourite projects this year have been the original 1940s ones. So that's what I want to do more of next year. As much as I liked knitting the contemporary patterns, I like the history bounding looks, no, like the 1940s patterns just make my heart sing. The garments make my heart sing. The process of knitting them make my heart sing. So that's what I'm going to do more of next year. I've got a few planned. I've got some, I've stocked up on yarn because of course we are now back in lockdown in the UK. Well, we're in tier four where I am. I imagine the rest of the country will be in lockdown soon. That's what I want to do. I want to do more lightweight projects, I want to do more two-ply and lace-weight projects. I see how I feel about Feral after I complete Yell. I might take a break from that and do something different. I also want to do some historical knitting. So like if you watched my sewing video, my definition of historical is anything pre the end of World War One, so 1918 backwards. So I've got a pattern from Wearing History for a 1918 cardigan, which I'd like to knit. I've also got a pattern for a knitted corset, which I'll be talking more about at some point next year. I'm desperate to try that. And I want to knit one of those 1890s cycling sweaters. Of course I do. So that's what I'm hoping to do. I think, you know, this is the wonderful thing about documenting your making process and evaluating it is you learn what you like and what you didn't like and what worked and what didn't work. And I know now going into 2021, I want to make more historical knitting patterns. So I think that's just probably long enough as a video. I hope you don't mind these long rambly chats. It's nice to be reflective, I think, particularly after this very difficult year. I'll say it again because I said it in my sewing video. Um, one of the best things to come out of 2020 for me has been, you know, this community, this uh, not just you who subscribe to my channel and comment on my videos, which is, you know, amazing. But I've also met so many like-minded people and, you know, people I now consider friends through costume and historical costuming and things online. So the fact that there are other people out there who like <laughs> vintage knitting patterns, which is one of the nichest interests, um, is amazing. And uh, it's it's just so nice to find people who will let me talk about it. <laughs> oh, thank you all so much. I'm wishing you all the best at the end of this really tough year. Wishing you all the best for the new year. I hope it may be better vaguely than 2021. And um, I hope you've enjoyed hanging out with me here on this channel this year. Here's to many more videos like it. So thanks for watching. See you next time.